Hi everybody. Welcome to Ordinary Differential Equation, the mathematical framework and tools for understanding, modeling, and predicting anything that moves. Welcome back. In this lecture, I want to talk about Appendix E, the dynamics of Hamilton's equations. So I'm just going to talk about Hamilton's equations in the simplest form, in two dimensions. So Hamilton's equations are derived from a scalar-valued function of the phase space variables. We call that the Hamiltonian. And the vector field, or Hamilton's equations, are given by these sort of cross derivatives in some sense but with a minus sign, and that's very important. These generalize to higher dimensions in a very natural way. Q and P are often, in applications, the configuration space or position variable, and P is the um, associated or conjugate momenta associated with that particular configuration space variable. This is a big subject. It's a fascinating subject, but I just want to talk about some of the basics here so that you've seen them once, and hopefully you'll see them again. So the point of view of the Hamiltonian function is that it's constant in time. So verify that. dh dt is dh dq q dot dh dp dp dot. Now you see why those cross, those sort of cross, cross terms in Hamilton's equations arise and give you this structure for conservation of the Hamiltonian. Often the Hamiltonian in applications has the interpretation of energy, so we would view this as conservation of energy. This implies that the level set of the Hamiltonian function, the set of points in the phase space, so that h equals a constant, generally is constant in time. It's an invariant set. Generally, it's a one-dimensional curve. It could degenerate to a fixed point, or it could be you could view it as a curve containing a fixed point. And I'll give examples of that in a little bit. Now we can compute the Jacobian. The Jacobian will tell us about stability if, of a fixed point if we evaluate it at a fixed point. But we can see that if we compute this Jacobian, it's 2 by 2. So we know we have a nice formula for the eigenvalues, the trace divided by 2. But look, the trace, some of the diagonal elements, is 0. Okay, trace divided by 2, trace is 0, plus or minus 1 half the square root of trace squared, that's a 0, times the square root, square root of trace squared minus 4 times the determinant. 4 comes out, cancel the half, and we look, we have this expression for the eigenvalues. So, if Jacobian is positive, we have a center. We evaluate this at a fixed point. If it's negative, we have a saddle. If it's zero, it's we have a double zero. It's degenerate in some sense. Okay, there are two linear Hamiltonian systems on the plane that are interesting, and they come up and surprisingly, they're useful in many applications. So this is called the Hamiltonian saddle. Lambda is a positive constant. So lambda over 2, p squared minus q squared. And we can factor that. And so the Hamilton's equations are given by this. And we can plot the level curves of this function. And this is what we get. Okay, this is where the saddle point. So the origin is a saddle point. And p equal q. and p equal minus q are these two 45 degree lines. And if you think about going back to Hamilton's equations, 
h equals zero is the value of the Hamiltonian at the origin, the saddle point, but it's also the value of the Hamiltonian for p minus q equals zero and p plus q equals zero, the stable and unstable manifolds. And the stable and unstable manifolds divide the phase plane up into four quadrants. And these are the two quadrants for positive energy, and these are the two quadrants for negative energy. And these are what trajectories look like. And you can verify that I have the arrows right. This type of example comes up in, as a paradigm for many chemical reaction dynamics problems. Motion, trajectories moving over a saddle point. Okay, here's the other example, the Hamiltonian center omega over 2, and then we have p squared plus q squared. So the origin, p equal q equals 0, is still an equilibrium point. But Hamilton's equations, or in matrix form, look like this. And it's easy to see what the level curves are. They're ellipses. And they look something like this. The origin is a fixed point. And so we have periodic motions surrounding it. All right, let's look at a couple of bifurcation examples. I want to talk about the Hamiltonian saddle node and the Hamiltonian pitchfork. Now, when I did saddle node and pitchfork early on, chapter 8, these were one-dimensional bifurcations. But Hamiltonian systems as I've developed it here, are two-dimensional. So it has to be two-dimensional. And we have this um, Hamiltonian function. So this is the model for the Hamiltonian pitchfork. Model in the sense that I gave you models for the Hamiltonian saddle node, and we went from that point. So right down Hamiltonian vector field, we can find the fixed points. We see that there are two fixed points for lambda positive, no fixed points for lambda negative, and one for lambda equals zero. Sounds like a saddle node, but now we're in the Hamiltonian setting. And if you plot the, uh, you can go through the, gen the, the linear stability analysis for the fixed points, just like we did earlier, but no fixed points for lambda less than zero, two for lambda greater than zero, plus it's two-dimensional. And so if we plot the level curves, representative level curves for these three distinct values of parameters, this is what we get. No fixed point, a degenerate saddle node point, and lambda equals zero, and that splits up into a center and a saddle. We get this fish-like structure. This is the classic Hamiltonian saddle node, the fish-like structure. So we have a hyperbolic point with a homoclinic orbit connecting it to itself, bounding a region of periodic motions. Hamiltonian pitchfork, here's the model for this. And you can guess what's going to happen. We're going to go from 1 to 3 through a non-hyperbolic point. So you write down Hamilton's equations. You check for the equilibria, and we have one equilibria for lambda negative and three equilibrium for lambda greater than zero. All right, you can do the general nonlinear the stability analysis, but the most informative thing is to plot the level curves. So for lambda less than zero, there's one fixed point is stable. Okay, for lambda equals zero, it becomes non-hyperbolic. And then it splits up into three, a saddle, and two stable points, two centers along the side. The classic figure eight type structure that we've seen in different settings, but not the Hamiltonian setting. So this Hamiltonian is kind of underlying many of the examples that I did earlier, and um, so it would be useful for you to go back and look at those. Uh, examples that came up were um, the LaSalle invariance principle, um, and then the um, linear linearization stability.
section. Okay, so Hamiltonian bifurcation theory is is really fascinating, and and you see you have this extra level of structure on it because the Hamiltonian is a conserved quantity, and you have this the the um, vector field can the smallest dimension is two for canonical Hamiltonian systems for each each position. There's a uh, associated momenta. They're even dimensional, two n dimensional, although there are generalizations in different settings. Um, but uh, the, the, these Hamilton's, Hamilton, Hamilton's equation come up in many applications. Bifurcation theory is different. Same type of principle in the sense that saddle node, you went from zero to one to two, pitchfork from one to one to three, so it's the same type of idea, but the preservation of the Hamiltonian adds interesting structure to it. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about Hamilton's equations. It's a big subject. I've given you some references that you can follow up on it in more detail. And then the final appendix is about chaos. See you next time.